Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands. Well, last time, we went on a holiday to New Vegas, and we have come back rich, just ludicrously rich, thanks to an incredibly lucrative book trade, and uh, I know precisely what we're going to use that money for. Still, before we get into that, yes indeed, let's nip back to Megaton because uh, there's a couple of things we need to sort out. Number one, I'm no longer on vacation. And that means it's time to go back over to the traditional green pip boy. Number two, now I've got a blend of uh, New Vegas guns and Fallout 3 guns, uh, I need to figure out what the new loadout's going to be. Because uh, probably I'd like to be running a little bit lighter than what I'm doing right now. Okay, Driver Nefi's Golf Club, that's just a souvenir, that can stay here. Paciencia, however, ooh, that one's more interesting. Okay, just for now, till I get a better weapon with an actual scope on it, let's do a sniper rifle, we'll come back for Paciencia later. The biggest thing I would say I got out of New Vegas was uh, that gun. This thing is, okay, fine, on paper, the damage doesn't look spectacular, but... The bonus crit chance is uh, so, so nice for this character with uh, ridiculous luck and finesse and the first recon beret and built to destroy. This thing is going to be getting crits, like, constantly. And yes, the biggest, most important thing, 556 ammo, I'm just sitting on 800 rounds, damn it, thanks to all the assault rifles and Chinese assault rifles littered across Fallout 3. Anyway, all that done, let's get back into the wasteland, because yes indeed, I've got a destination in mind for us today. And we're starting off right here at the Temple of the Union, though. Be a bit careful with the temple, because... Uh, okay, two fun facts about this building, which is once the escaped slaves have uh, cleared out one way or another, this building becomes the spawning ground of a random encounter. So if you go back into it later, there might be something nasty spawning in there with you. And number two, as you can just see down the road over there, slight oversight, I guess, which is uh, the caravans of this game do circulate around the various towns and population centres uh, in the wasteland. However, the game doesn't like have a flag for a location being abandoned. So even though the slaves no longer live in the Temple of the Union, the traders just keep coming and stand outside anyway. And speaking of traders, that leads us uh, very nicely into what we're doing today. Because we're making a trip to their home base, Canterbury Common, very nearby to the temple. And here we go as we sneak into town, as I'm sure you've all guessed, today we're going to be looking at the Superhuman Gambit. Which I find to be a fascinating little mission. About, yes, a town being plagued by the ongoing struggle between a superhero on the left there, the Mechanist, and a supervillain on the right, the antagonizer. And uh, what I really like, by the way, is uh, the town in no way wants you to, like, you know, back the superhero and defeat the supervillain. They're just tired of this nonsense playing itself out of their city, and they want it to end. They do not care if you kill the supervillain, kill the superhero, or just wipe out both. They just want it to stop, which is, uh, to my mind, a bit of a delightful subversion as to what you might be expecting the town to ask you to do in a superhero versus supervillain conflict. Instead, the game takes the position that these are both deeply troubled and slightly delusional individuals uh, who probably just need to be stopped for their own good, which is delightful and... Uh, Accordingly, there's, um, yes, a delightful selection of uh, ways you can deal with this problem. Starting off with what I like to think of as the Occam's Razor solution, which is, uh, if they're both going to stand uh, next to each other, right now, introducing the plot and whatnot, there's no particular reason whatsoever why you don't just, uh, you know, pick a safe distance, stand back a little bit, zoom onto an ant of your choosing, and... Uh, Okay, how about we just drop a nuke right in the center? And that should be everybody. Okay, not everybody dead. The Gutsy survives, which is quite frankly impressive. And oh, blimey, he's also... Okay, the Gutsy was the only survivor. That was slightly embarrassing. Okay, let's just try that again. Whew. You wouldn't believe how much trouble those two have caused in this town. We've been looking for someone to get rid of them for a long time. But you just walked in and cleaned up the town. Easy as you please. We're in your debt, that's for sure. I'm mayor of Canterbury Commons. Think of me as your own Uncle Roe. And take this as our thanks for cleaning up town. 
And this time, a much better. Everybody died uh, to the initial nuke, and uh, that's it. Problem has been solved. Reward handed over. Magnificent. But no, no, no. That's a thing that Alternate Universe John did. What an absolute bastard that guy is. The real reason, in fact, that you do not want to do it this way is because it means you don't get the best rewards. The good stuff you only get by sorting things out a bit more elegantly. Also, I do just enjoy the backstory. So, if we ask Ro here about the antagonizer... Now, one day there was a crazy woman leading a bunch of ants into town. She said humanity was dead and the ants would inherit the earth, stuff like that. Well, that gave Dom plenty of time to line up a shot or two on the ants. She ran away, but every once in a while she'd stage an attack again. She wasn't much of a threat then. In fact, she was sort of entertaining at first. Gave everyone in town something to talk about. But when the mechanists started fighting her, things got bad. Ants are easy to shoot, but add robots with lasers, and it got real nasty. So yes indeed, in the world of Fallout 3, an ant-themed supervillain isn't even really deemed that remarkable. I mean, there's giant mutants wandering around, zombies are a real thing. This is just deemed, you know, pretty much business as usual in the Fallout universe. The mechanist used to be our town mechanic, Scott Walensky. Quiet guy, but plenty fierce with a wrench and some solder. Guy used to take care of a robot that protected the town until it got torn up in one of the ant agonizer's lame little attacks. I guess he took it personal because he made a mechanical suit and called himself the Mechanist, said he would lead a robot army to fight her. Now he doesn't even respond to his name, and his robot army is more dangerous to the town than the ants ever were. And there we go. Uncle Rose seems more nervous about the Mechanist than the giant laser-spitting robot than the actual ants that started the trouble in the first place. So, uh, yes indeed, killing either or both of them, that would be an acceptable solution to Uncle Rowe. There is a tiny bit more we could do with Uncle Rogue, but let's not worry about that for now. Instead, yes, let's keep our attention on our two super-powered troublemakers. And here's the kid we want, Derek. Oh, Derek's an absolute bloody star. I love this, kids. Oh, man, did you see it? Did you see it? The antagonizer was all like, fear me. But the mechanist was all, stop, evildoer. So, yes, indeed, the kid is super into this. He thinks it's awesome. Derek's also quite the font of useful information, so in particular, ask him about the antagonizer. I don't know much about her, except she really, really doesn't like people. That's kind of cool. I mean, sometimes people are jerks. I think her lair is somewhere in the caves to the north of the city. I've seen her ants down there once in a while. Joe Porter said he found out something about her, but my uncle won't let him tell me. He says, don't encourage the poor boy. So there we go, useful information and a further follow-up lead. Beautiful. Though, yes, the real joy is, if you dig into, know anything else that could help me stop them. No way! Don't stop them, they're awesome! Unless, maybe you're going to be a superhero too. You could be called Awesome Claw and fight them with an army of Death Claws! Now that right there is a Doc Mitchell-style personalized line that is dictated by your special, though... I will admit, it is not the line I was expecting to hear. You get told you should be Awesome Claw if you have high agility or charisma. But there is actually a dedicated line for a high luck character. The incredibly lucky guy or incredibly lucky girl, depending on your character's gender. I was kind of expecting that one, so I'm not 100% sure why the game just assigned to me Awesome Claw, but I'll take it, it's a good name. The alternatives being Super Humongous, if you've got high endurance or strength, and the Brilliant Shadow, which is for high perception or intelligence. Though, the funniest option of all is, if you don't have any high special stats whatsoever, where every stat is about six or so, he just straight up tells you you're not good enough to be a superhero, which is delightful. Meanwhile, as Derek implied, yes indeed, let's have a chat with Joe Porter. Actually, I think I might know something useful. One of the traders told me she sounded like a girl he used to know. Girl's whole family was wiped out by ants. Not long before she showed up here. But they never found any trace of her body. Said her name was Tanya Kristoff. That might just be our little antagonizer. 
And there we go, we've now got ourselves a name. Brilliant. So, as we now know from experience, yes, yeah, some of the robots can be an absolute bloody nightmare. Let's start off with the antagonizer, given, yes, she was the one the people in town were definitely giving us the largest amount of information about, and uh, there are a whole bunch of ways we could do that too. Number one, we were told to head north from town, that's where she's going to be. And while there is a path that leads down into the Warrens where you have to fight a giant number of ants, no, 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 don't you worry about any of that. Literally right on top of the hill just outside town, Average looks great, that will take you straight into her bloody throne room. There we go, literally just rock in, and there she is just round the corner. So, hilarious, nice, easy option number two. As she's not hostile on sight, how about we go and offer to join her? This is an unexpected surprise. A human who understands its place. One who realizes that ants are destined to walk this land, while humans and their toys are destined only to rot beneath it? Perhaps even a human who wants to join the winning side, yes? One that would humbly beg admittance to the Ant Queen's court? Oh, absolutely. But before we get to that, there is also a speech check to talk her down. But no, instead, let's go full supervillain for a second. Because if you just say you're going to join in her crusade to wipe out the mechanists... Excellent. Rise, my loyal soldier, and prepare for battle. We leave to fight the mechanists immediately. Humanity shall fall. Our colony shall feast. But wait. I sense an intruder in my royal lair. Who dares interrupt my celebration? It must be the Mechanist! His meddlesome metal army is already inside! Destroy them! And there we flip it go, the Mechanist instead comes to us! So we don't need to bother going into his lair at all! I can just basically stand aside and let this happen. So she's just going to start taking out some robots, the ants are going to be charging in too. I can choose to assist or not and... Okay, they are Bethesdaing pretty hard right now, which is everybody stuck in the doorway and nobody could get past. Marvelous. Fortunately, he's only brought, you know, Protectrons rather than the really, really good Mr. Gutsy. So uh, there we go. Those are slowly going down step by step. Be a uh, flipping beautiful. There are some more robots at the back, but yes, he really should have brought the Mr. Gutsy. I'm genuinely curious who's going to win this one, you know. I'm just going to not get involved and see who wins in a straight-up fair fight. And, uh, okay, looks like the ants are mostly dead, but also the Protectrons are just not really doing anything. In fact, they seem to have got bored and decided to wander off, so... Okay, seriously, you guys are not supposed to be protecting the... Never mind! Um, so it turns out the, um, the Mechanist is now dead... And the antagonizer won! Lovely! So that does get you the mechanist costume and helmet. Brilliant. But, um, yes indeed, that's not the only thing we're after. Because if you do it this way, on his corpse, it's just a basic laser gun. We can do better than that. Now leave me. I must prepare to leave the pitiful town of Canterbury and plan for greater conquests. So there we go, the Mechanist is dead, and she's decided to naff off because Canterbury Common is no longer worth her attention. So the situation has been technically resolved. Option 3, rewind time to when we walked into her lair, and yes indeed, how about we pop on Lincoln's hat and the naughty nightwear we got from Vegas, because uh, put all that together... Oh, speech 95, lovely. But this time we're going to be talking Tanya down. You're wrong. Humans are cruel, hurtful beasts. They can't be saved. We can't be... I can't. I can't go back. But I can't keep doing this. I can't be as bad as they were. Please, I think I've made some terrible mistakes. If you really think I still have a chance, just let me go. I'll give you the suit. No one ever has to see the antagonizer again. Just please, let me have another chance. So there we go, except the suit, there's Tanya, let her go, Antagonizer no longer exists, meaning the town mechanic has got no one to fight, you could say this is a rather neat and tidy ending I suppose. I however reject all of the previous solutions, because uh, yes indeed, the superhuman gambit contains uh, one of the most ludicrously elaborate and well hidden alternative solutions in probably any Fallout game ever, which is uh, you need to play her own meta-narrative against her. 
She has embraced the comic book character of the antagonizer, which means that if we want to talk her down without relying on a very hard speech check, we need to learn about comic book continuity in the Fallout universe. And absolutely nobody tells you about this. There is not the slightest implication anywhere in the town that you might want to go and do some reading around comic book characters. And the comic book information is not in a very obvious location either. It is buried away deep in the DC ruins where you have no reason to ever go and find it. But you know what? I said this was going to be a very thorough, complete Fallout 3 series. So that's what we're going to do. The district we're headed for is called the Mason District. It's located inside, yes, this slightly smaller walled area on the left of the river. And there are two ways you can get in. Kicking off in a very easy to access location, Wilhelm's Wharf, once again, apologies to Grandma Sparkle, rest in peace. We have got ourselves a sewer outlet. And through here, we have got ourselves the County Sewer Mainline. If you follow that far enough, that's a back door into Hubris Comics. However, it's not, to my mind, uh, the more interesting way in. There's not that much good loot in there, it's just a giant pile of ghouls. No, 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 no. We're going in the more interesting routes. Head back to the library where we started this uh, very episode. Uh, and yes, yeah, start going in a uh, north and westly direction, though uh, something bad is... Oh, it's just an ant. Okay, well, you know what? That is uh, very appropriate. As we're not going to be killing ants down the line, taking out a handful of ants right now, and seriously, the number of crits that you get with that gun is uh, ridiculous. That was like two crits in a single volley. Oh, this gun is lovely. Just to make your way up the road to the west, watch out for a raider camp on the way. You can take them out or sneak past them, doesn't really make too much of a difference either way. And yes indeed, we're looking for what is officially called the Flooded Metro. Because as you may or may not be able to hear right now, yes indeed, Flooded Metro means we're going into a rather flooded environment and that means my luck. So best thing you can do is make sure you have got a beautiful, beautiful dart gun to hand. Dart gun will help you out a lot. Specifically, it'll slow them down enough that yeah, you can get some good hits in the face and some good crits will do. Oh yeah, that's the stuff right there. Getting crits right in the eyeball. Oh, I'm still in a bit of trouble, by the way. Apparently, I'm in danger, but I don't see it. Oh, I found it, by the way. Turns out it was a Milo Hunter, and that is a bit of a problem. I'll admit it. Did I just miss that? I did miss that. Okay, that's fine. Just slow it right down and keep slowing it down. Then just keep staggering it. Even with broken legs, these things can be surprisingly fast, actually. Let's just get out a good gun when my AP comes back. Going upstairs. Bad idea. Don't get a good shot at the eye. Okay, we're now into, yes, Milo Hunters, etc. You'll very often see some really, really bloody nasty high-level Milo variants in this bit of the world. So, uh, okay, it's all going to be fine, probably. But while we're passing by, do not miss. Right at the start, when you first get down to the first set of stairs, uh, take a left and follow the blood trail, because round the corner we've got ourselves. Uh, just got Bethesda by a skeleton. They're marvellous. Guns and bullets, some ammunition, and not a bad gun. Scoped Magnum, not bad at all. If in the past you ever stumbled into this dungeon and took one look at it and decided, I'm not doing that, I would not blame you. It is, yes, a very difficult fight through many Milo's who could be very tanky on the high difficulties. But it's all worth it. Just work your way down, head over in this direction. And then to get back out, just to work your way back up. But no... No, no, no. Make sure you take a diversion down in this direction. You'll know you go in the right way when you start hitting mines, traps, etc. There's something you are not going to want to miss down in this bit of the world. So, there's at least one more mine. Oh! Okay, that was a really well-hidden mine. I did not see that one coming. So, okay, just over the top. There was definitely a trap there. I probably can't... Nope, can't take care of that. So, may as well just, uh, yes, deal with this. Disarm you, etc, etc, etc. But right here, we've got a very cool, unique weapon that I imagine many people have missed because there are so, so many random stations just dotted around Fallout 3. I do not blame you for not exploring every single one, okay? The flooded metro does not sound exciting, but there is one very good thing. 
There is a dead guy right here, and he was working on something beautiful, actually. The Shocker. And this thing is great, okay? Decent, solid amount of damage, and on top of that, bonus damage versus robots and power armor. So, I tell you what, for weighing only six, this thing really packs a bloody punch. Anyway, that's safely in a hand, if you'll pardon the pun. Let's make our way back over ground, because yes indeed, we were coming here for a particular reason, of course. And that's to make our way to the Mason District. A very minor district that yes, for the most part, you have very little reason to ever come and visit. And, uh, okay, let's just say I'm not alone here, as you may have guessed from uh, the compass. Yeah, there's, uh, there's potentially a few problems. That's just rad roaches. That's fine. The bigger problem is, uh, yeah, round the corner, actually. There we go. That's our real problem right there. Super mutants, though. Basics, we can now snipe if we just get them in the head. So, uh, okay. Take them out if we can. Just move uh, slowly north. Oh, and I think I might have just been a bit spotted here. So, okay, just head upstairs. There's a couple of, yeah, bombed out buildings uh, that can make good sniper spots. Potentially. Especially this one that's got a sniper rifle in it. Just in case you didn't figure out the obvious. So, uh, yes indeed. This could be a decent enough place to try holding out right here. Especially as yet to the south of the park. You do get yourself another guns and bullets. And there's some more ammo for that gun. From here, we could try and take them out. Or, brute, wasteland captive. Don't care about you. You might give me good karma, damn it. Right, buddy. How about we just get... Oh, dear. Well, we're not going to get a good shot right to the head against you, are we? No. No, we are not. Right. How about we just hold out here and wait for him to come to us? I think we can handle this just using the ancient martial art technique of firing tin cans at him until he falls over and dies. Here we go. Tin cans right in the head, if you would be so kind of buddy. That should stagger you enough. Down you go. Lovely. Okay. Just take him out. One by one. Maybe just take out the ones on one side. You're a basic, so okay. You, we can deal with. There we go. Nice. More. Okay, plenty of basics. This should not be too difficult. But yeah, big flood of punk. Just need to clear it to mutants. Obviously, that's my destination to the north over there. Big statue pointing me in the right direction. Okay, mutants defeated. I've even rescued the Wastelander. Didn't push me too morally good, so that's absolutely a-okay. And there we go. That should be everything standing between me and Shubra's comics right up here. There's also another uh, metro station that takes you through to a different region. We're not going into that today. And there we go. Shubra's comics spec flipping tacular. And while we're passing by... Dean's Electronics right here in this shelter too. So yes, never pass up a free skill book and uh, oh, this place is great. It is possibly the most needlessly content rich area in the entire game. There is uh, so much stuff here for an area where the game never actually tells you to go. It's just an absolute delight. Now there is one advantage to the way we came. I am arriving right here at reception, which is precisely where I need to be. Because right here on the receptionist terminal, letters to the editor. Requiem for an antagonist. Grognak the Barbarian is an excellent comic for many reasons, but one of the most widely respected ones is the depth of its villains. From the cold-blooded manipulations of the Mansorian to the love-hate romance with Femra, the stories of Grognak's enemies are every bit as fascinating as his own tales. But for my money, no tale is more tragic or more fascinating than that of the Antagonizer. While never developed as fully as major villains like Skullpocalypse or Master Donald, the portrait of an orphan girl raised by ants and instilled with a bitter hatred of humanity has tremendous potential for reader connection and possible redemption. However, in Grognak and the Ants of Agony, Mr. Natura threw away all of that potential simply by treating the antagonizer as a two-dimensional villain with a futile and pointless grudge against mankind. His writing replaced her subtle undertones of lost humanity and tragically lost innocence with the worst sort of moustache twirling cliché dialogue. It was an offence to a deep and tragic character. How a hack like that continues to find work in comics is beyond my comprehension. Hubris Comics should fire him and return the series to the capable hands of Mr. Morales. Until that time, I refuse to buy another comic from what used to be my favourite publisher, Obsessed and Oakmont. So, 
Yes indeed, this is a letter about the character of the antagonizer. And given the antagonizer that we've spoken to, i.e. Tanya back by Canterbury Common, one has to assume that the antagonizer comic she read, i.e. where she got the idea, was indeed Mr. Neptura's. However, the real story of the antagonizer, according to this letter at least, is yes, a much more sympathetic tragic portrayal of an orphaned girl who could potentially yet achieve redemption. So now we've got this information, we might be able to, yes, throw something new at Tanya when we run into her next time. And seriously, the game never tells you to come here and find this. It's just a thing you can stumble across that helps you understand how Tanya might have become the antagonizer, what comics she read that put her on that path, and how you might be able to use your knowledge of pre-war comics to put her on a better path. It's just an absolutely fascinating additional way to resolve this mission. And on top of that, yes indeed, the testing notice. Beginning Monday, members of Grognak's Little Heathens fan club will begin visiting the officers to participate in testing the Reign of Grelok. And this is not just flavour, this is something we could go and find, because seriously, as I say, Hubris Comics is just filled with a bunch of really high effort extra contents. And here we go, the testing room, because there is indeed a secret extra video game hidden inside this video game. So just drop downstairs, look for the only terminal that's actually lit up, and uh, here we go. And I bet a whole bunch of you have never seen this before. So basically, yes, it's a very simple text adventure. And in many ways, I would say the ancestor of uh, the various games you can play in Fallout 4. This was massively expanded in Fallout 4. But this here, this is where it started, damn it. So here we go, Reign of Greylock, start off by looking around. You're standing in a wide plain, foothills to the north where clouds gather around an ominous peak. A dirt path winds from a lonely chapel to the east, through the plains where you're standing, south into a bustling town. Wispy mists gather over the marshland in the west, where a thin tower stands alone in the bog. Now, this game is actually very simple. There's basically, as far as I'm aware, only one solution. If you do anything in the wrong order, there's no alternative solutions. It's a very simple little easter egg. So, let's look at the inventory. I have got a rusty sword and a drinking flask. So, okay, we're probably going to be needing to uh, improve all of that yet. Gotcha. So, step one, head north to the mountain. Greylonk is here. Probably don't bother attacking him just yet. Would be a bad idea. Instead, look around. You're on a craggy, wind-blasted face of a mountain. Storm clouds coil around the summit, pelting you in the sparse vegetation with torrential downpour. Far below, beyond the foothills, a wide plain stretches across the southern horizon. Greylonk is here, still spewing his heresies. But we do have something between the rocks. So I could use the sword on Grelog, but no, bad idea. Instead, uh, investigate the object. So it is a rough gemstone. With that in hand, uh, we can now go back south again. Next up, we're going to be wanting to head west. That brings us into a swamp we can look around here. So a narrow stone path into a dark marsh. Greasy bubbles float to the top of the bog waters on either side and pop lazily, spattering your legs with muck and slime. A short stone tower is here, no door is visible, and the stones are smooth and polished. A balcony juts out midway up the tower's face, the heady smells of incense mixed with the nauseating stench of the swamp. A stone path unfurls eastwards uh, towards the plain again, and there is a wizard uh, gesticulating at me. Well, that's just perfect, let's have a chat to him. So the Slayer of Greylock appears, a uh, raw stone in hand, uh, just as I've seen. The wizard's pointy hat bobs excitedly as he points a finger at you. Suddenly, a pale orange light extends from the knobby finger and draws the gemstone from your bag before you can react. The gemstone halts and hovers in the air before the wizard's nose. Essence be true, powers renew, fatty who do. And with that, he slaps the stone, smashing it against the smooth stone of the tower. In a burst of light, the stone splits into two. One lands in each outstretched palm of the hopping wizards. Shard for the sword, a wrapper and iron, and she'll find Greylock's black heart for you. Take the chaff too, you'll need payment for the smith to forge the weapon. So okay, we've now got ourselves a refined stone, so I think we know where we want to go next. We were told there was a town to the south, let's go there, have a bit of a Luxy roundy. And everyone's a bit nervous because of the apocalypse in Greylock and whatnot. But we do have a blacksmith and a priest. So naturally, we know who we want to speak to. The blacksmith. 
He's about to dismiss me when I produce the polished gemstone. He sets his hammer aside and twirls his moustache. A right fine stone that is, what would you be needing then? So following my careful instructions, he reforges my rusty sword with the magical shard. Brilliant. While I'm in town too, may as well speak with the priest. Greylock is come, we are forsaken, erp, he continues. As you recover from the stench of his priestly belch. Oh, sorry, that was supposed to be a burp. I did not read erp as a burp. My mistake. You're told the priest has fled from the nearby chapel. When Grelok arrived, the dead in the cemetery began to rise, his congregation scattered. If you could rid the place of zombies, I'll give you the key. So okay, we should probably go and do that too. So back north to the plains, head the one direction we have not been to yet. So eastwards, there's the chapel. Have a bit of a Luke roundy. Got ourselves a lovely small chapel here. Unfortunately, yes, we know this place is not in good shape. But what we do have is a small cemetery and a zombie tottering nearby. Together with an open grave. So, step one, you sword on zombie. So, my blow knocks the zombie into the grave. Probably have a little bit of a luxy in the grave right now. Several bloated rats and zombie corpses float in a foot of filthy water at the bottom. Do not fall in. Grotesque zombie head is stuck on a root near the top of the grave. You bag the horrific trophy as proof of your deed. So, okay, that's the submission complete. Brilliant. So, probably at this point, yes, start heading west then south back to town and back over to the priests. Praise you the priest hiccups, perhaps Grelok's influence isn't so strong. With that, he turns his decanter over the head and tosses it into the fireplace, where it bursts into purple flames and burns up almost instantly. I must gather the faithful, here's the key. So there we go, I've now got access to a new bunch of stuff at the chapel. So back north and back east, look around the chapel again and now we can examine it properly. There is a deep stone cistern near the entrance. It is filled to the brim with blessed water. More than enough here to fill your tiny flask. So, okay, I have now completed the main missions and every submission in the game. I have got a magical sword. I have got holy water. It's time to go and pay a visit to Greylock. So, use magical sword on Greylock, and now we've got everything ready. He lowers his great horned head and bellows laughter in your face. You grit your teeth and swing a mighty two-handed blow, the magical blade ringing clearly, even amid the tumult of his throaty cackling. You swing the sword so fiercely, it escapes your grip and hurtles into the open maw of the monstrosity, lost from sight in the arid darkness of Greylock's throat. You step back as Greylock jerks his mouth shut, and stands upright. He is still for a moment, then starts clawing at his neck. Muffled, a ringing can be heard, as if from a great distance. Suddenly, his chest bursts in a fount of viscous green blood. The ringing can be heard clearly now, and as thick lifeblood oozes around the protruding tip of the magical sword, the storm cloud swirling the peak are already clearing. Greylock is defeated. The end. Thanks for playing. That is the entire game. But I just love, once again, it's just here, hidden away in this random building full of extra stuff. This building, by the way, is also delightfully well trapped up. So, yes, indeed. We saw previously the odd little uh, pitching machine. There are a whole bunch of them here, so screw it. I'm activating this trap anyway just because uh, I want the pitching machines uh, to toss a giant pile of uh, baseballs and probably, ultimately, grenades. There's typically a grenade right at the end of the, uh, I was about to say clip, but it's a pitching machine, so not really. Okay, well, nothing's exploded yet, so... Okay, just baseballs on this occasion. Lovely. And just keep on keeping on round the corner to here publishing. And uh, yes, indeed, there's more here yet. Like, you know, an entire game within a game and a previously unmentioned solution to a quest on the other side of the map. No, that's nothing. We barely even got started here. Just loop around the corner and we have got ourselves a big old pile of, yes, turrets taking on a bunch of ghouls, so may as well just let them take out each other. Because over there we have got ourselves a mad Johnny Wes, the lad who set up all these lovely traps. Because yes, this area also has a named boss who just has a minigun. And when I say a named boss, it's not just any old name either. Mad Johnny Wes is a reference, presumably at least, I've never actually seen this confirmed, but it can't not be, to Wes Johnson, who provided many of the voices to Fallout 3, including my darling beloved Mr. Burke. 
And fun fact, literally within the last month, he provided some voices to a Fallout 76 Nuka World on Tour update. So uh, the lad's been involved with Fallout for quite some time. Still, for the time being, we've got ourselves, yes, chaos going on with various roamers and whatnot. Some of them seem to be paying attention to me. Sneak attack crit. Not sure how I got a sneak attack crit there, but it's all absolutely fine. Just stay back, stay out of the way, be ready to deal with good old Mad Johnny. Though I think possibly, yes, his turrets may have gone berserk at some point because he definitely took out his own turret friends there. And this, I'd say, would be an excellent job for Lincoln's repeater, though. Whether we can really get the hit in, I do not know. Right, we got ourselves him right there. 35%. You know what? That's a... Oh, we got his gun out of his hands. Okay, with no gun, he is going to be in much worse shape. And now he's possibly coming for... Never mind, he got his gun back, but that's fine. Gave me an opportunity to just uh, get around the side over to here. I'm assuming we can just get a shot and if we get lucky round about these parts, just... If I can find a place to stand, I could not find a place to stand. Okay, just gotta figure out how to uh, get round to him. Don't mind me, buddy. There's plenty of cover in this room. It's all gonna be a-okay. We're gonna be able to shoot each other at some point, I'm sure. It's all gonna work out fine. Here we go, just loop round the back and in just a second. Buddy, 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 buddy. I'm so sorry, but you need to go down at this point. So, Mad Johnny Wears momentarily will, with a lovely critical strike, be taken down. And with that, if we are very lucky indeed, we might just be pushed over to the next level. Okay, I'm nudging up lockpick by three. So, with a hat, that's 50. And now I know I can get speech to, uh, yeah, 95. Screw it, let's make that 100. That's the power of impartial mediation. Love it. And do the same for science, because yes, Lincoln's hat is plus one to intelligence. So I could put that on, and that will be science 50 as well. Beautiful. Nudge up explosives a bit. I do enjoy explosives. And there we flip it go. So that's us pretty much done with your brisk comics. But yes, indeed, with our newfound knowledge about the antagonizer, we can finally enact the most interesting ending to the antagonizer's story. So here we go. We now know for certain she got the idea from a comic book, and specifically, we know which comic book. What? No. No children's book could possibly capture the true depth of the antagonizer. So okay, she's a bit off the deep end for now, but let's keep going down this route because yes indeed, I have read the antagonizer might well have been able to redeem herself. You really believe that? When I read that comic, it explained so much where I came from, who I was destined to be, what I had to do. But it never said the antagonizer could ever have a chance to go back to being normal. It never said I had a chance. Please, I, I think I've made some terrible mistakes. If you really think I still have a chance, just let me go. I'll give you the suit. No one ever has to see the antagonizer again. Just please, let me have another chance. And there we flipping go. Once again, we get the suit, but to my mind, yeah, just the fact that we now know precisely how she got this idea, it just helps flesh out the story a bit. Anyway, good luck with your new life, because we've got the suit, though what we did not get is her unique weapon. If we kind of, you know, help her to embrace her super villainy a bit more, she would give us a unique knife that comes with a bit of poison. But poison is not that good. The damage over time is uh, pretty poor, to be honest, so it's not something we need to get. I'm happy just to take the suits. And okay, inside this mod, the antagonizer's costume, DT of only 4, DR of 20. The helmet, meanwhile, DR of 6, and uh, no DT whatsoever by the Luxy of it. So, okay, that is really not that good. We can do without that. That's absolutely fine. Because uh, I know someone who'd really bloody like to be given this thing. And that's her arch nemesis up on the hill over here, the Mechanist. So, okay, let's go wrap this up properly. Here we go, a robot repair center, and obviously we're going to be taking on a handful of robots. So it sure is convenient that earlier this very episode, I picked up a weapon that does bonus damage versus robots. 
Okay, Robo Brain right here. Don't, no, don't, don't turn around. Never mind, it turns around. Okay, this is going to be fine because, uh, yes, unarmed attacks get bonus damage in that. So this is getting bonus damage versus uh, robots. So even on very hard difficulty, and even though, oh, the camera is not cooperating. There we go, it's in a better position now. There's that bonus EMP, and down you go. Okay. So, we've managed to take out the Robo Brain, no problem whatsoever. Though, there is, you know, potentially a better solution. Yes, there is nothing to stop you skipping all of this. If you're good enough at lockpicking, you can just basically, yeah, skip straight to the mechanist. No problem there whatsoever. No issues in the slightest. But, um, yes, we're gonna have to be doing this a different way. And we don't really want to be going that way either, to be honest. No. No, 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 no. There's a much better solution, especially if we go in this direction. Together with something very peculiar about this area. Though, to be honest, when Fallout 3 came out, it wasn't peculiar. It's just peculiar now. This is one of the only areas, I think possibly literally the only area, that was copy-pasted straight out of Fallout 3 into New Vegas. If you go to New Vegas, specifically Old World Blues, and go to the Securitron Deconstruction Plant, starting from the place I'm standing right now, the rest of this dungeon is copy-pasted, with a couple of tiny changes like doors versus open doorways. But basically, it's the same. There's also one weird little sting in the tail, which is uh, people often say, oh, Fallout 3 versus New Vegas, Fallout 3 dumbed things down, wasn't a proper RPG, Fallout New Vegas, now there's a proper RPG. Yes, but in the one instance I'm aware of, where Fallout 3 and New Vegas had literally the same dungeon, the one in Fallout 3 is by far the most RPG-ish. Here we go. Big arm pile of robots, and is that a gutsy at the back? Could be a gutsy at the back. Well, we saw how tough gutsies were at the start of this, given, yes, um, the mechanist gutsies just destroyed me, so we do not want to be taking him on. And we don't have to. Instead, this place is the perfect location for a bit of sneaking and a bit of hacking. So, pop a stealth boy. And honestly, you could just, yes, try and uh, bull rush this because there's a whole bunch of turrets. These aren't here in New Vegas either. The turrets aren't just in the Fallout 3 version. Come in over here, however, and there's a terminal. This terminal, again, was removed in the Fallout New Vegas Old World Blues copy-paste. But in Fallout 3, they're here, letting people who can do a bit of hacking turn off the turrets and give themselves an advantage. But most importantly, just ahead through here, this room at the top, this is the absolute creme de la creme. That terminal there, that's the key one, right there. So, just head over to that, but before we interact with that, this safe needs to be cracked open too. If you can do some hacking and some lock picking, oh, the game gives you a bit of a reward. So just grab all of this, but more importantly, one encryption key. Use that over on the emergency terminal. And now activate the emergency pulse explosion. So just crack that up and in just a flipping second, as that is uh, charging right now. That deals with literally everybody. Every robot in the entire area has been taken care of. And that solution doesn't exist in New Vegas. It's only here in Fallout 3. So, uh, yeah, a really weird duplicate dungeon where the Fallout 3 one has got a lot more interesting stuff going on than its equivalent in Old World Blues. So, with everyone either passive, had turned off, or exploded, that means we can now safely head on our way to the Mechanist Lair over in this direction. Lovely. Held myself to lying congressional style because, you know what, you can never have too many skill books. And then eventually, activate the coffee brewer because that's what activates the needlessly elaborate door opening mechanism. Lovely. So, just keep on keeping on. Seriously, you thought vault doors were bloody fancy. In fact, they enjoyed this kind of joke so much, they basically repeated it in Fallout 4 Automatron, where there is also a needlessly over-fancy door-opening mechanism. Well done. You have defeated the vile antagonizer, and you've brought back her suit so that we may destroy the last taint of her villainy. Hand it to me, and I'll make sure that no one else can ever bear the mantle of the foul antagonizer. So, we could just hand it over, but no. 
no, 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 we're going to sort this out here because, uh, yes, rather delightfully, the best solution to the quest of uh, a superhero and a supervillain locked in internal conflict is uh, going up to both of them and saying, seriously, guys, you've got issues. You both need so much therapy. Is that true? Have I really become a threat to the town? Do you really feel that way? Am I really the villain here? Does this mean I should stop myself? I... I guess I could just give up my suit and stop being the mechanist. But I couldn't face the town after causing that much trouble. Here, please, take the suit. I don't want to think about it anymore. So, that gets me the suit, meaning yes, in fact, I've now got both suits. So there we go, his costume, DT5 and DR20. Okay, it's identical to the antagonizer. It just looks a bit different, though I don't actually want to do it this way. Because if you do it this way, once again, you miss out on him giving you the special unique weapon. And his weapon is actually pretty good. So even though it's not really morally the right thing to do, we're just going to rewind time a second. Here you go, buddy. Have the suit. You've won in some slightly unspecified way, given one, you never defeated her, and two, she's actually in a better place, like, emotionally and mentally than you are right now. But screw it. Here's the suit. Excellent. The evil taint of the antagonizer will never darken the land again. Now that the antagonizer is taken care of, Canterbury Commons is safe. And for your loyal assistance, I'm honored to present you with this laser pistol, crafted from my last loyal robot assistant. May it guide you well. But the Mechanist cannot rest. Not while there's evil afoot in the Wasteland. Farewell. So, we have officially got rid of both of them, meaning Uncle Ro is going to be delighted, but um, yes, there is one slight issue, which is one, we didn't get the costume, and two, we've got negative karma, because he still thinks he's a superhero. This is not really the best solution for him. Now, if you just want the antagonizer's costume back, you could just steal it from him right now, but um, slight issue, and I know this is a bit on the evil side. There is one really fun easter egg you can only access if you've got his outfit. So, I'm really sorry, buddy, but I kind of want the gun and the outfit. And there's only one way to arrange that while still getting Tanya her really good ending. And that's to nail this guy's head to the wall. So, there we flipping go. In fact, I'm pretty sure we just... Okay, you know what? It was worth it because that is one a hell of a trick shot. Though, yes, a funny old thing, a railway rifle pinned heads are a bit weird. Which is, uh, yes, they're no longer officially part of the corpse. They're their own unique thing. Meaning stuff like this can happen, even though it probably shouldn't. And here we go, Protectron's Gaze. Effectively, a shotgun. Five blasts doing five damage each, which is uh, honestly not spectacular, but it's a fun weapon to have. It's a really light energy shotgun. It's just a lot more interesting than any other reward, I would say. So, following morning, everything's done. Time to go check in with Uncle Ro. I do believe it's fair to say you've saved Canterbury. And unlike that mechanist, you did so with significantly less stress all around. Now, I do believe this is our agreed-upon payment for your fine services rendered, and a little bonus as a special thank you. Basically, yes, it is 200 caps if you just do the bare minimum, 400 if you pass a speech check with him, which I did, and then another 200 on top, in the event you neutralize both of them rather than just one. So with that, the town of Canterbury Common is safe, and I would say that is enough for now. But what we've done today rather nicely sets us up for the next stage of our adventure. Because there is one more mission we can do in this part of the world, and it is so, so easy to miss. But if you do it, bloody hell, it could be a game changer. And on top of that, as I say, the Mechanist Armor opens up a lovely Easter egg that's going to kick off our next journey into the Wasteland. So, join me next time and everything will be revealed. Hopefully, you are looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been Many a True Nerd. And this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! 
My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rad scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.